We know that clearly what's taking place here in the book of Amos is um, a word given to the people of Israel as the Lord is dealing with uh, perhaps, you know, just some things that have separated fellowship with the Lord. And we see that Israel as a whole at the end of chapter 5 will be judged for uh, their sin. Sin has to be judged and dealt with. But as you look at Amos's message, we looked at chapters 3 and 4. And five are three chapters that deal with messages to the people. Chapters three and four, the message was very direct and straightforward. Deals with the topic and the area of their sin and how they transgressed before the Lord and actually how they were living for God. Remember that their worship to God was not worship at all, but rather was sinful offerings and sacrifices because... They did not honor the Lord and keep his word. Now, in chapter five, we have another address. But remember, it is a lament. In, in some of your Bibles, it might say a lament for Israel. And the lament here is that specifically. The lament has to do with a word. A funeral message is what lament means. It's a dirge. It's a somber message. And the message is somber because it's dealing with God's judgment that is going to come to the people in the northern kingdom. Now, what we also seen within chapter 5 is we've seen in verse 4, the Lord says, seek me and live. Three times the Lord gives the invitation in Amos' address to seek him and live. In other words, the Lord is saying, for those that have a desire to turn to me, he's saying, turn to me. The Lord is willing to work with those that have a desire to draw close to him and those that are seeking repentance. The Lord clearly is making it available for them to turn from that which separates them from fellowship with God. But we know, according to the Bible and history as a whole, we see that the northern kingdom was ultimately judged for their wickedness and their sin, more in particular, idolatry. And the Lord highlights this in this lament, in this if you will, funeral song. That's kind of the picture here in chapter 5. So as we pick up here in verse 8, at the very close of it, notice how he starts off the message here, and he kind of lays it out in this way. Verse 8 says, speaking about the Lord, let's start in verse 7. He says, You who turn justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. Now remember that, here he is, the corrupt leadership of the people of Israel. Their leadership was corrupt, and he's reminding them that rather than justice being that which they desire, they made justice into bitterness, something undesirable and something that they clearly had no desire to practice. He also even lays this out to them, that it wasn't only justice that was corrupted, but it was also righteousness. In other words, he says that they laid righteousness to rest in the earth. In other words, they brought it low. That righteousness was not important to them, that they had no desire to live a life of righteousness before the Lord their God. Nor did they desire to be people who upheld justice. Now, the only ones that could uphold justice and righteousness are those that were leading. So remember, this is a direct direct target toward the corrupt leadership in the northern kingdom of Israel. But then there's this, what we would call parenthesis in verse 8. It's as if Amos for a moment kind of stops and says, here's something you need to consider. Even though the context of chapter 5 has to do with the lament for Israel because judgment is coming, Amos draws their attention to something very important. He says in verse 8, he, speaking about the Lord God of Israel, or the one in which they are rejecting and resisting, the one who represents justice and righteousness, he made the Pleiades and Orion. Now remember, these terms are used in reference to he's made the constellation, the stars, the galaxies. In other words, notice that Amos here for a moment stops and focuses the attention on the Lord God and who he is. Notice what he says here. He turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark as night. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. And notice what he says, the Lord is his name. 
It's as if Amos is saying, do you understand who you're really working against? In resisting justice and making it wormwood, bitterness, and laying righteousness to rest in the earth, making it low, as if justice and righteousness are not important, do you understand that you're not really resisting those who desire to be good, but you're resisting the Lord God who is the sovereign creator of all the earth? Look at what he's saying here. The Lord is his name. Notice the word there for Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh. That is the national name of the people or of the Israel, Israel's God, the covenantal God of Israel, the God of covenants. So notice what he's saying here. He's saying the Lord is his name. No other nation around them was their God named Yahweh. You see what he's doing here? He's drawing their attention to understand that the great and sovereign Lord, the creator of the universe, is also the one who has a covenant with them. And he's saying, it's not so much that you're breaking the covenant of the God of Israel. You're going against the creator of the world. In other words, you don't stand a chance. And remember, we kind of closed last week's message out with that statement that the dice of the gods are fully loaded. There's no way that you can try to go up against God and win. He's reminding them that this great and awesome God who is the creator of all things is also their God, the God of Israel, who made a covenant and agreement with them. Look at verse 9. Still speaking on the context of God, he says, He reigns upon the strong. You see the word here for reigns? The idea behind the word is very clear. In other words, he flashes forth destruction. Because he is creator of all things and he is the sovereign God and he is the Lord God who has a covenant with us, he destroys the strong. Now the strong here, the idea behind the word, clearly means fierce, harsh power. The only ones that could be considered or referred to as strong are those who have taken justice and turned it to bitterness. Those who have taken righteousness and brought it low. For whatever reason, they feel that they are strong and mighty. And to some degree, it seems that Amos is charging them because perhaps in their mind, they feel that they are invincible. Remember, the backdrop of the book of Amos is here's a group of people who are truly obsessed with power and have it and riches and wealth. He's not speaking a message to a group of people who are poor and are needy, though there are the poor and needy in the land, but they're being taken advantage of by the strong and mighty that here he's rebuking. We've always said as we've been working our way through the book of Amos, it's always difficult to go and tell someone who truly believes they got it all together that they really need God in their life. It's always a difficult thing. But ultimately, God has a way of bringing all of us to our knees. At some time, we turn to the Lord, we repent, and we say, God, forgive me. Why? Because you came to that place where you realized you were a sinner in need of a Savior. Right? But in this case here, remember in chapter 7, as we go a little bit further, the priest of the northern kingdom, guess what they tell Amos? Why don't you go back to your people and preach that message? We don't need God here. Well, this is the whole purpose of what the Lord is saying here. And yet he's saying, here is the problem. As the leader or the scriptures say, as the king goes, so go the people. We could see why now there was so much corruption in the northern kingdom because the leaders were corrupt. He goes on to say here, he rains ruin upon the strong so that fury comes upon the fortress. Notice the term strong and fortress. Pay attention to that. What is he saying? there will be none who will be able to withstand. And keep in mind what he's calling their attention to. He just said, this one is the creator of all things. It's the Lord God. So to resist justice and righteousness is to resist God. To fight against that which is just and right is to fight against God. Well, we all know nobody's a match for God, right? But in their pride, in their wealth, 
in their love for wickedness, in their idolatry. Now, remember, they really thought that they were worshiping God. Did they not think so? That's what he said in chapter four. Look at verses four and five. We emphasize this quite a bit the last couple of studies. But remember what he said. He goes, you guys were coming and you were offering up offerings and sac sacrifices. You were praying, you were praising, but you weren't doing it to me. It was just your religious service, your outward expressions. Listen, he says, these you do love. Did he not say that in verse five of chapter four? But he never said, you love me, because they never did it out of a love for God. They did it out of religious service. And God didn't want their religious service. He wanted their heart. And so we see here that he's reminding them very clearly that none will be able to withstand him. In other words, they have nothing or no one to run to that can stand against the Lord their God. It's an interesting thing when you have to be reminded of who the Lord is in your life. Remember in verse 12 of chapter 4, that verse, everybody was like, whoa. There's the verse that says, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. It seems that they forgot who the Lord is. And, and the reminder here is that the Lord is his name. Well, they know what his name is. But he's drawing their attention to the very power of God. And that in some way they conjured up a power that they thought, for whatever reason, was greater than God. And look at what he says here in regards to those that are strong and those that perhaps maybe put their trust in a fortress. Guys, listen. You know, Hosea is reminding not only those who will be dealt with, but those who are given the opportunity to repent and turn to the Lord, that there is nothing greater than God. If you're going to put your trust and hope, put it in the Lord. If you're going to rest in the promises of God's word, make sure that it's God's word, not man's word. That the only one that can help and who's mighty to save and who can deliver and who can set free is the Lord God, regardless of the circumstances or situations that surround. And listen, when one thinks he is strong and perhaps says, I have a fortress I can depend on, the Lord is saying, are you sure? Because the only thing that is sure is the Lord. He is our strong tower. Is that not what the psalmist says? And what else does it say? The righteous run into it and they are what? They are saved. In verse 10, he says this. What's the problem with the corrupt leadership? He says here, they hate the ones who rebukes in the gate and they abhor the ones who speak uprightly. Look at they hate those who say, hey, maybe we're not doing things right. They're telling them they're not saying be quiet. They hate them. What did Jesus say about hate? That it's murder in the heart. Because ultimately, that's what hate leads to. Correct? And so what is he saying here? They hate those who speak uprightly. You'll see a little bit later, the prudent, the Bible says in verse 13, they keep silent at the time. Why? Because evil is abounding. And they're hated. In other words, we don't want to hear what you have to say. We're fine. Hey, we're, we're going to the temple of the Lord. We're offering up sacrifices. We're offering up offerings, or for that matter, here we are. We're, we're giving to God what he's asked of us, they're saying. To kind of fix that, it wasn't that they were going to the temple, but to them, they, they had their temple worship and, and temple sacrifices in the northern kingdom. And, and for them, they felt this should on, God should be thankful for this. But they hate the one who rebukes. In other words, the one who corrects, the one who says, hey, maybe we're doing things wrong. The corrupt leaders rebuke him. And he says in the gate, you know what that means? This is where justice is administered. This is where decisions were made. In the place of justice, they hate those who speak truth. That doesn't sound too far about where we are today, right? Those that speak truth today are hated. We, in a sense, we can relate to this passage here. But look at what else. It goes on to say, therefore, because you tread down the poor, 
Well, notice what else he says here. They, they, they rebuke the ones in the gate and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. So I think it's safe to say that the ones that are being rebuked in this lament have no desire for righteousness. But even though as a whole, the, the, the nation as a whole has no desire for righteousness, what do we see in the midst of God's judgment on them? His grace. Because he invites them in verse 4 to seek him and live. In verse 6, he says this again, seek the Lord and live. You see, the constant invitation from the Lord, even though the time of his judgment is going to come, the Lord is continually inviting them, if you just turn to me, you'll live. Look at what else we see. Therefore, because you tread down the poor. So listen, they have no desire for righteousness. And when it comes to living righteously or doing something righteous, listen to this. He begins to list their sins. He says, therefore, because you tread down the poor, you, you turn them away and take grain and taxes from him. Though you have built houses and hewn stones, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards. You shall not drink the wine from them, for I know your manifold transgressions. Well, he could have just said transgressions, but he's saying manifold transgressions. In other words, your transgressions have reached heaven. Your sins are multiplied one on top of another. They are great. And he's saying this, what you've put your trust in. Remember, guys, they, they truly believe that they're strong and they have a mighty fortress. And he's saying, you built houses and guess what? You're not going to dwell in them. You got vineyards and you're not going you're, you're, you're to partake in the wine of the vineyard because of your manifold transgressions. Listen to this. And your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes. In other words, the day is coming when all that you did that was corrupt and contrary will be dealt with. Diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. And you know, it's interesting because verse 13 gives us insight as to why the Lord is saying on more than one occasion, seek me and live. Look at verse 14, the third time. Seek good and not evil that you may live. Notice what it says. They are in some evil times. And he's saying, seek good and not evil that you may live. Once again, for the third time, he's saying, now, now why is he saying this? Because listen, even if one or two turned to him, they had opportunity to repent. Now, we know the land, the northern kingdom of Israel, is already going to be dealt with. There's no way of escaping that. Because of the idolatry in the land, that which God set apart for his people and for himself, they forfeited it and turned it over to the worship of idols. And the Lord is saying the northern kingdom has to be dealt with, but it doesn't mean that God is done with them. God always looks for a remnant if there's just one. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? If, if there were ten, I'll spare it. In Jeremiah's day, if there's one, I will spare it for one. But there was none. You see, God is not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3.9. He's not slack concerning his promises. He's not willing that any should perish. It's not God's thing to be up there and say, hey, I just want to wipe everybody out, though we kind of heard the Lord say that at one point, Moses, we'll just start all over. His desire is so that his people would be what? A light to the world around them. Israel failed to be that light. They were in darkness, but yet they felt that they were in the light. And the Lord explained to them in chapter 4, with Amos's second address that it wasn't light at all. It was wickedness. And he's reminding them once again here, just in the passage alone, he says, the prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. In other words, it doesn't matter if they open their mouth. Well, guess what? They're going to be shut up. Because those around them, they hate the ones who rebuke in the gate. They abhor the one who speaks uprightly. It's an evil time. 
repentance start here? It starts with naming their sins. And here the Lord is in a sense kind of just laying it out for them. Like, here's your opportunity. Repent of these things. You see, sometimes, you know, some people will say, well, I don't even know what I'm doing wrong. Well, the Lord here has pointed out very clearly, these are the things that have separated my fellowship with you. And he's laying them out. So, you know, we talked a little bit about repentance last week, right? Turning to the Lord. And, and one of the best ways to start is confess those sins to the Lord. Speak them out. Whatever it is that you need to, to get forgiveness of. The Lord is faithful to forgive. I mean, look at here. He's dealing with a nation and his people. These are his people. Listen to this. And he's saying judgment is going to come to the land because that was part of the covenant. This is why Yahweh, the God of covenants, is referred to because he's reminding them. I'm not doing anything to you that's punishment or wrong. I'm honoring the covenant we made. A couple of Sundays ago, we looked at the blessings and the cursings. Remember that? And what were the cursings? Well, they wanted the blessings. Did they not say, whatever you say will do. And so here's all the blessings. But what comes with the blessings? The cursings as well. Because the Lord says, if you do not do, then this will happen. So what's happening is, once again, even in his judgment, God is faithful. And that's why people have a hard time. In the Old Testament, they say, well, man, he really judged them. How could he be good? Because he kept his promise. We always want the blessings and the good, right? You want the good only. Don't read those verses that, that talk about the bad. You want, you want to read all the promises of God in the Bible and claim them. Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it, right? But you're dishonoring the word of God. You take all of God's word. And some of those promises are what? In this life, you will have trials and tribulations. That's a promise. You're like, I don't like that promise. That is a promise in the word of God. It is scriptural. Jesus said it, but then he said this. This is going to happen. Not, not if, when. It's a for sure thing. He says, but don't fear for I've overcome the world. I mean, you're like, it's easy for you to say, Jesus. Jesus. You overcame the world. We have to live in it. But then he'll say, you live in it, but you're not of it. John 17. Good reminder, right? But look at this, guys. The Bible also says it's been granted for us to suffer. You're like, God, grant me favor. God, grant me blessings. God, grant me deliverance in this circumstance. Right, guys? Anybody ever prayed that way before? Okay. But the Bible also says it's been granted for you to suffer. The Lord is saying, here's an opportunity for you to turn to me. Seek the Lord God. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And look at what he says. So the Lord of hosts will be with you. I want you to draw your attention to three titles for the Lord God. Right? Jot it down in your notes. Verse 3. Look at what it says. For thus says the Lord God. The word there, Lord, notice that it's lowercase. That's the Hebrew word Adonai. It's the Hebrew word Adonai. The word there for God is not the Hebrew word Elohim, but it is Jah or Javi, which has the meaning of God. It's the covenantal name of the God of Israel, but, but it's just the God of Israel. That's kind of the picture there. Adonai, the God of Israel. When you get to verse 8 and you see the word there for Lord, it's Yahweh. Yahweh. And it's all capital letters. It's a different Hebrew word, still speaking about the God of Israel. But this is Israel's covenantal God, the God of covenants, the keeper of covenants. It's interesting. You see the play on words in his name here, right? Your God, verse 3, is speaking, the one who keeps covenants, right? Because judgment is coming. And then look at verse 27. Look at the end of it. It says... Says the Lord, look at the word there for Lord. It's the Hebrew word Jehovah, whose name is the God. Now notice that it's not the Hebrew word Jah, it's the Hebrew word Elohim. 
this is the name of God, the supreme God, and it also says here, of hosts. What does that mean? It's giving God in a different light for them to understand that the Lord, Jehovah, Elohim of armies, the just God, the warrior, the one who executes justice, is saying it. You see, what the Amos' prophecy is doing and his word to the people is he's reminding them that this is what you're up against. There's two ways that we can go about this. One, you can submit and receive three times, seek me and live, or you can resist and do what? Hate those who rebukes in the gate and abhor those who speak uprightly. Thus you will experience the judgment that is coming your way. Even with God's final statement in that the Lord of hosts will take care of this, the Lord God of hosts will take care of this, He still provides the means for them to repent and turn to the Lord. Seek good and not evil that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Look at that. And then he says this. Here's, here's what you must do. This is how you seek good and not evil. Hate evil and love good. Hate evil. God calls his people to hate. I know that throws some people off. You, you, you have a hard time putting God and hate in the same sentence. But the scripture is very clear that we do serve a God of hate. He hates sin. I know it sounds awful for me to term it that way, but that's a biblical term. That God hates sin, and I'm thankful that he hates sin. And he's calling his people to do the same. Hate evil. God will never ask you to do what he hasn't already done first. Hate evil, love good. And then look at what he says here. With this you will be able to what? Establish justice. You see the word there established in the original language means to make or to set. Establish justice in the gate. In other words, come back to what God had initially prescribed for you. Notice what he's saying, that it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. It's another term there for Israel. That the Lord would be gracious. Notice that he uses the word there, Remnant has the idea behind it as, as a small number or a small group. And God always has a remnant in every generation. Did you know that? The Lord always has a remnant of people in every generation. God calls us to be a remnant in a fallen world around us. God calls us to be, to be light in darkness. As a matter of fact, Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 13 as he preaches the message on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. In that same context of passage, Jesus also says, you are the light of the world. You're salt in your light. And when you consider the context of salt, well, we know that at least in the days of Christ, it had, it had great significance and use. As a matter of fact, it even had monetary value to it. You know that statement when we say, you know, he's worth his salt. That statement alone dates back to Roman times. Because Roman soldiers, some were paid in salt. Some also were given money to go and purchase salt. Salt was a commodity. And then some would say, well, why? Was it hard to get? Well, didn't they have the Dead Sea? There's clusters and clusters of salt, not the same salt. The salt here that Jesus was speaking about was that which had perhaps three purposes. Number one, salt was a preservative. It, it, it preserved meat. It was like the refrigerator of the old times. And it preserved meat. It preserved that was great value in that day. Because in preserving meat or whatever the case might be, in that regard there, it provided life, sustenance, and ability to continue on and to last longer. That's what it did. Salt also had monetary value to it, like the Roman soldiers, as I just explained to you. 
and some would be paid in salt because it was very useful and needful in that day. Salt also was used for its flavor. You guys know today, it's still used for its flavor. At least in my case it is. I ain't down with Mrs. Dash. I like salt. But, but here's, here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus, when he commands, when he, he's not suggesting, he's saying these are the principles of the kingdom, and it's nothing different than the message that Amos is declaring to the people in that day. He, he's saying to them, listen, your whole purpose is to be salt and light in the world around you. Isn't this why God prepared the people of Israel for himself? To be a light to the nations around them? To be a light in darkness? And see, in the same way you and I, the message hasn't really changed. Yeah, we're dealing with the Old Testament, but it might be the Old Testament with a relevant message, the gospel of the kingdom. We're still God's people. Now, we don't replace Israel. And yes, there are many promises in the Bible that don't pertain to us as the church that only pertain to Israel, but it doesn't change who we are. The message hasn't changed. God has always called his people, whether it's Israel or one of the 12 tribes of Israel or the church to live a life set apart and to be a witness to represent God's glory and not man's glory. Because oftentimes man can take that which God has set apart to bring glory to him and corrupt it to bring glory to himself. Isn't that what Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of? And even the disciples were kind of scratching their heads in some statements that Jesus made. Remember when Jesus rebuked the religious leaders and he says, you know what, you, you, guys, you guys swear by the gold in the temple. You know what he was telling them? That gold in the temple means more to you than the presence and glory of God that dwells behind that veil where the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is. Somewhere down the line, the glory behind the veil became meaningless to you and the gold in the temple became that which you praised and you swear by the gold and you could care less with the presence that dwells there. He rebuked them for that. They were doing the same thing that they were doing here. Doing the same thing that some do today when they treat the things of the Lord and their walk with God as something common. And then remember the disciples like, look, look at our temple. And then Jesus kind of gives this prophecy that not one stone will be left upon another, right? And then those around are like, this guy's crazy. Remember when Jesus even said in regards to his body, he says, you know, you tear this temple down and in three days it'll be raised up. And, and yes, he was speaking in regards to his body, but, you know, they're looking at the temple and they're saying, there's no way this thing can be destroyed. You know how long it took for this thing to be built? But later on, Jesus said it would be destroyed. Not one stone will be left upon another. Forty years later, it was destroyed in 70 A.D. That which was set apart for the glory of God became the glory of man. And this is what God is doing with them here. He's saying, listen, Jesus says that we're to be the salt of the earth. You and I, guys, listen, we are to be that which preserve. We're to come alongside other people and we're to, we're to share the word of God with them. Listen, you might not be a great Bible teacher. God doesn't call you to be a Bible teacher. He calls you to be a witness to share the word of God. And in some way, when a person's life has been used and abused by sin or whatever the case might be, and we come with a message of hope, we begin to preserve that life, and then it becomes useful and fit for the master's use. In the same way, we bring value to that life, just like value was added to ours when we came to faith in Christ. That's what being the salt of the earth means preserving and valuable and we bring flavor life is good because our sins are forgiven amen, amen. And, and you know what you might say well you know look at it this way well what happens when jesus says when the salt loses its flavor it's no longer good for anything he's not saying that the salt don't doesn't taste like salt salt will always taste like salt the point that Jesus was making is there's never a point in time where salt doesn't taste like salt. He's saying for it to not be useful anymore. It still does serve a purpose and it is still useful, but guess for what? 
to be trampled underfoot by men because once salt loses its ability to be used as a preservative or to be used as you know monetary gain or to be used in flavoring it is then used to be thrown in a walkway so it can create a path so it can be trampled underfoot by men you see if we're not the salt of the earth then we're just being trampled under the foot of the enemy it's all we are and instead of making crooked paths straight we become that useless salt that creates crooked paths for many to walk on and see what Jesus is stating very clearly here listen we need to understand what the psalmist says I think Jesus is speaking and reminiscent of what Psalm chapter 14 and verse 3 says it says all have turned away all have become corrupt there is no one who does good not even one believers are to preserve truth and goodness in a fallen world that's what we're to do and in the same way this is what the Lord is saying to them here he's saying wake up hate evil love good establish justice in the gate and it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph therefore the Lord God of hosts the Lord says listen to this he's going to begin to explain to them here's what it's going to be like he's talking about the day of the Lord okay therefore the Lord the God of hosts the Lord says this there shall be a wailing in all the streets and they shall say in all the highways alas alas they shall call the farmer perhaps he gives a picture of a farmer because remember Amos was a farmer they shall call the farmer to mourning and the skillful lamenters to wailing the skillful lamenters those are the ones that they would hire to, to cry that was a job did you know that they hire you to go cry somebody you don't know passes away and they don't have enough family there to cry for them they hire a group of mourners and they say I'm gonna pay you for the day just go and cry at the tomb and they would that's what a lot of them were doing there with Lazarus and his family the Jews that followed Mary thinking that she was gonna to go to the tomb and weep why do you think they wanted to follow her and go weep they were paid to yet she didn't go to the tomb she went to the feet of Jesus but these professional wailers lamenters he says in all vineyards there shall be wailing remember guys what he said the strong and those that had fortress those that were putting their trust in their strength and their fortresses what what did they trusted their wealth and what is he telling them here all that you've worked so hard for listen to this all that you've worked so hard for guess what for I will pass through you says the Lord I will pass through you Th this should really challenge your heart and mind to consider something when God was delivering the people of Israel out of Egypt what do we call that the what pass over what is he saying now I'm gonna pass through you you see the Lord bring his people because they looked to the Lord and they were saying God help deliver us and when one turns to the Lord with all of his heart he passes over them and he takes care of them and he delivers them but he didn't pass over Egypt. What did he do he passed through Egypt did he not course he did now what is he telling Israel I will pass through you the day of reckoning has come the day of reckoning has come and look at what he goes on to say here woe to you who desire the day of the Lord for what good is the day of the Lord to you you know I, I look at this verse here and I think to myself you know He's saying there are some here in this day that are saying we can't wait for the day of the Lord and 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 they're worshiping idols and they're offering up false sacrifices and offerings to God but they really believe in their heart that they're doing the things right that's why Amos sets the record straight in chapter 4 and they're even saying yeah we can't wait for God to come and judge and God is saying you're the one I'm coming to judge you know that today for the most part of Christian doom that's kind of the way it is there are even some that call themselves Christians and they're talking about the day of the Lord as if it's going to benefit them and no it's not they're, they're welcoming and inviting the judgment that's going to come to them why because man has exchanged the glory of God for man's glory and because of idols in the heart and idolatry and because we take our focus guys listen do we not sometimes when somebody gets excited about the Lord hey let's go and let's win this for that hey relax 
You're too excited, buddy. Listen. In telling someone to slow down rather than go all out, you're working against rather than for. <coughs> we should have a heart that is so fixed on being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Jesus said, go shine your light. Did he not say that? So what? So that they may see your and glorify. It's like Jesus could have taught this message. It's like it's, the message is not really different. Jesus said, go shine your light so that they may see your good works and glorify your father. And do you understand the idea behind all of this? What is the purpose of God's people? And if we are not shining light, then we are what? Displaying darkness. And if we are not the salt of the earth, then we are to be cast out and trodden underfoot by men. You're either one or the other. Like J. Vernon McGee says, you're either a saint or you ain't. There's no in between. But the good thing is, is that with God's judgment and justice, there's always God's mercy and grace. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. And notice what he says, all that you trusted in, all that you, you think that it's working for you. He's saying, listen, I will pass through you. Woe to you, you who desire the day of the Lord. The wicked did not properly discern. And that's true. The wicked will not properly discern. For what good is that day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Think about that. You, you flee from a lion. You're like, whoo, I just got away, right? And all of a sudden, now a bear meets you. You ain't getting away nowhere. You, in other words, what is he saying? There's no way out of this. There's only one way. Hello? And he's saying here, listen, you think you got away, but the bear's on its way. Or as though he went into the house, leaned on his hand or leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him if you escape the lion and the bear and run into your house the serpent's going to bite you ultimately it's the serpent that we would see here that deals the death blow and truly it is the serpent in other words there's no way to escape the judgment that God is going to bring the only way of escape is what he says it three times seek me and live seek me and live he goes on to say is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light is it not very dark with no brightness in it I hate I despise your feast days look at what he's telling them he's saying that which you thought you were offering up to me in worship and praise that which you thought you were, as if, as if this was moving the heart of God. The Lord says, no, I, I hate. You performed with a corrupt heart. What God wanted more than anything was, was it coming from a pure heart, a right heart? He says, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. All these little things that you think you're doing that should be drawing you closer to me, if anything, have, have drawn you further away. And he says, these things in no way were anything that I accepted. Look at what he says. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Nor will I regard your, fat, your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. You sung to me, but they were... They were sounding brass and clanging cymbals. Wow. It was just noise. It wasn't a song. The sacrifices weren't truly offerings and sacrifices. This was all you. For I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But here's what you can do. Once again, he's saying, here's how we can fix this. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Because it is. The day of the Lord will be justice running down like water and righteousness like 
a mighty stream. And listen to what he says here. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? Yes, they did. What is he telling them here? He's referring them back to their history, saying, listen, we've been here before. And what happened? What happened in the wilderness? A generation had to die because of unbelief. You see what he's drawing their attention to? We've been here before. And look at what he's saying here. Listen to this. You, he says, you also carried Sukkoth. The word here for Sukkoth means the tabernacle. You carried the tabernacle. And then he says here, your king, they carried their king. Well, the word here for king is Molech. The idea behind Molech, a play on words here, is you guys were worshiping idols, sacrificing your children on the altar. And he goes on to say here, and Kuin, which are their, their idols, their Egyptian idols. Your idols, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. It's the same thing that Stephen was telling the religious leaders of his day in Acts chapter 7. He actually quotes this portion of Scripture. And you know what he's telling the people in his day after the time of Christ? He's saying, listen, the religious leaders are acting as though our fathers were acting in the day of their rebellion. What is he saying? If you guys haven't changed, God's judgment hasn't changed. They didn't like that. What did they say? We need to kill this guy. And isn't that what was happening here in this day? They hated those who rebuked wickedness. They rebuked in the gate. They abhorred those who, who spoke up rightly. And then notice what they were doing. You know, oftentimes we emphasize this, you know, when we look at passages like in 2 Kings chapter 17 and, and Deuteronomy 18, the the tragedies and the atrocities of those offering up their children as sacrifices, you know, and, and, and we look at that and we say they were doing, you know, child sacrifice. And, and we read this in the scriptures and we say things like, like, oh, that was so horrible in that day. But we do it here in this country as well. And you say, well, I don't. Well, if you pay taxes, you do. Because that's where your taxes are going. Right? Oh, it got really holy in here right now, huh? Hey, man, I just got to be honest with you guys. We always got to repent. You know, sometimes we say things, you know, we, we protest and, and they say, you know, we need to go and we need to stand over there. I tell you, you know what? If you really want to get real with this, just stop paying taxes. I mean, if you really want to go all the way out, there is a way to do it. Do it. Think about it. Even the church says we stand for this, but yet they don't. That's why Peter says judgment begins in the house of God. The church always has to go through a process of being pruned and refined. Our hearts always have to go through a sifting with the word of God. We always have to be reminded that we should never think we got it under control. The Lord's the only one that has things in control. And we need to constantly, constantly be resting in the promises of his word, saying, Lord, help us. May we never stop being a salt in the earth or a light in darkness. Think about it. When we look at this here, you know what's so corrupt about them offering up their children as sacrifices? It goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 2, what was the command that God gave Adam? As he placed him in the Garden of Eden, he said what? Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. That's a command of God. What, what was the purpose of it? Not so that they could just, you know, hey, make babies. It's good, man. No, because what God wanted to do was perpetuate what he already had. He created man good and perfect. There was no sin in the world at that time. Everything was good. And what did God want? 
That, that command, that, that, that word to Adam and Eve was so that God can perpetuate that which he created. God's purpose and plan was good for his creation and humanity. And the moment man started to kill man's offspring, it was an assault and an attack against the perpetuating of God's holiness and righteousness because man's created in the image of God. And the ones that God said, be fruitful and multiply, they were saying, we'd rather kill our kids than advance your kingdom. That is pretty powerful. They literally stood, withstood the very blessing of God from the very beginning of his word to his people and they're saying we resist and we reject we have no desire to perpetuate your kingdom we have our own and you see here the message hasn't changed have we stopped perpetuating the kingdom of God I think at times we have look at what he goes on to say here Therefore, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus. Damascus was conquered and destroyed, at least at this time, in 732. And ten years later, the northern kingdom was taken captive by Assyria in 722 B.C. Therefore, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. There's no way around it. God's going to deal with it. But if there are one or 100 or 1,000 that seek me, they will live. God always desires a remnant to be spared. Now listen, we're closing out a year. Let me ask you this question. How do we become fruitful and multiply? As Christians, how do we beget Christians? By sharing the gospel. Sheep beget sheep, don't they? And if you could look back in this last year and ask yourself this truthful question, could you have led more people to Christ this last year than you did? If the answer is yes, raise your hand. All of us are guilty of this sin. Because you know you could have. It's not that hard to go and tell someone about Jesus, but at some point we just felt like, you know, I'll go out with the outreach team. But you never went out with the outreach team. There's always opportunity for what? To advance his kingdom and say, in the spirit, we're going to be fruitful and we're going to multiply. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm not saying, hey, you know, like I say, we're, we're, we're down with babies. I got two dedications next service. As I say, if we can't save them, we make them here at Living Way, right? <laughs> but here's the point. Here's the point. We need to get out there. We need to win souls for the kingdom. We need to tell people about Jesus. This year is already over. And if the Lord tarries, may we win more souls to the kingdom next year than we did this last year.